All right, welcome everyone. My name is Brad Bell. I'm the William J. Connedy Professor of Strategic Human Resources in the ILR School here at Cornell University, and I also serve as the Academic Director of CARS. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our fall uh, CARS virtual partner meeting that's going to be focusing today on leading HR in a changing world. Perhaps the only constant over the past few years has been the ever-changing world of work. Although we may have hoped for a new normal to emerge once we got through the worst of the pandemic, what we've seen in reality is quite the opposite. As highlighted by these recent headlines, the work context remains rapidly in flux and HR leaders have really been at the forefront of helping their organizations navigate through all of this disruption. HR has been leading the way on implementing new work models, dealing with an evolving labor market, transforming business models, and managing a host of other changes. And HR has had to do all of this while making sure not to lose sight of evergreen priorities, such as advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and offering our employees a best-in-class experience. Our goal over the next two and a half hours will be to examine how HR has been leading their organizations through these various changes. Today's presenters will provide insights into actions, practices, and tools that HR can use to increase its impact on the organization in this rapidly changing environment. I'm really excited about the lineup of presenters that we have planned for you today. They really bring together the three groups that I think make CARS unique. The first is world-class HR leaders. The second is exceptional students. And of course, the third is outstanding faculty. We'll be begin today with a presentation by Kevin Cox, who's the Chief Human Resources Officer at General Electric. In 2017, Kevin led a project to develop a model of a world-class CHRO. The goal was to provide a blueprint that could be used to help incumbent CHROs improve performance, help aspiring CHROs to develop more thoughtfully and rapidly, and to help CEOs and corporate boards have a better understanding of what world-class HR leadership really looks like. Given all the changes that we've seen in the last few years, Kevin and his partners recently developed an updated version of this model, Chapter 2, that he'll be sharing with us today. Next, we have three of our Mylar students who have been working as CARS research assistants this semester, and we'll be sharing findings of a benchmarking project they've been doing to better understand how organizations can engage employees in today's hybrid and remote environments. Holly Harmon, Dan Miller, and Rashi Vora will walk us through how companies are tackling the challenges and opportunities associated with some of these new work models. And then finally, CARS professor Chris Collins will be sharing with us some recent work that he's been doing around the employee experience. He will integrate findings from across focus groups that he's been doing with the diversity of different organizations to help us get a little bit of insight into how we might rethink as well as improve the employee experience. We would really like for today's session to be interactive and have set, a set aside time for Q&A following each of the presentations. So please do submit your questions as we go through today. We'll be compiling those and again, we'll be presenting them to our uh, presenters uh, to answer following each of their presentations. I would also encourage you to use the chat function during today's uh, session to share your own thoughts and experiences, as well as to engage in a dialogue with other attendees. So today, as I mentioned, we're going to kick it off with uh, Kevin Cox, a little bit of uh, background on Kevin. Kevin is, as I mentioned, the Chief Human Resources Officer at GE, where he's responsible for leading GE's global HR organization, including talent management, leadership development and learning, compensation and benefits, as well as employee relations and security. Kevin has been a leader in human resources for nearly three decades focusing on driving business results through the unique intersection of strategy, talent, and culture. Prior to joining GE, Kevin served as Chief Human Resources Officer at American Express for 14 years. Previously, he spent 16 years at Pepsi-Cola and the Pepsi Bottling Group, where he held positions leading strategy, business development, technology, and human resources. Kevin has extensive board experience, having served on the boards of Kraft Heinz Company, Corporate Executive Board, Virgin Mobile USA, American Express Global Business Travel, and Chef's Warehouse. Kevin also actively gives back to the profession through a variety of organizations. 
He's the former chair and also a current advisory member of CARS. In addition, he serves as chairman of the Health Transformation Alliance, as a board member of the Human Resource Policy Association, and as a member of Gartner's CHRO Leadership Board. Kevin is the recipient of the 2015 Distinguished Human Resource Executive Award from the Academy of Management and is also a fellow of the National Association of Human Resources. As I mentioned, Kevin is actively involved in all that we do here with CARS and at Cornell, uh, and we're really delighted to have him here today to kind of share with us his experiences leading HR in a VUCA world. So with that, Kevin, I'll turn the floor over to you. Brad, you've come up with the, uh, first of all, can you hear me okay, Brad? Just so yes. Mike's back. Sounds great. Um, so first of all, you just come up with the most elegant way in the world to say I'm old and crusty. And so uh, I will, I will uh, copy guilty plea to that. Um, I appreciate the chance to be invited to talk about this a little bit and hello everybody and, and, and welcome. And uh, I, I do look forward to sharing some thoughts with you. Um, one of the things that isn't in my bio is um, I decided to learn how to fly an airplane uh, last year. And uh, the relevance of that point here is um, when I was thinking about doing it, uh, a, a very experienced pilot said to me, Kevin, you should do that for a number of reasons. He said, but one of them is you'll never see the world the same way again. He said, you'll just never think of from the perspective of, of flying a plane, you'll never think of the world the same way again. And even though I'm pretty uh, young in my journey, I just got my license uh, last month. Um, I already know what he's talking about. So for the next hour, 45 minutes or so, if you could just sort of elevate with me, like take our altitude up to 20,000 feet, that would be helpful because I, I don't exactly know who's in the audience right now, but I can imagine that you're sort of your nose is right against the grindstone. You're dealing with lots of here and now sorts of issues. You're not completely sure you're gonna make it to Friday, much less to you know next year or, or, or 10 years down the road. That's the nature of HR. It, it, it's what I love about HR, no two days are the same. Uh, it's incredibly demanding. It's getting more demanding every day. But the downside of that is you can get a little myopic and you can get a little bit focused on sort of the stuff you're dealing with in your inbox today and it can prevent you from looking down the road a little bit. So elevate with me, if you will. Let's go take our altitude up to flight level, you know, 200, which is 20,000 feet. And, um, and let's think about this from a big perspective. 24 years, next year will be a quarter of a century, which makes me truly feel ancient. Uh, but I am still counting, so I'm, I'm not dead yet, as they say, and uh, still hopefully have something to add to, uh, uh, to the field and to the function that I love so much. When Brad asked me to do this, um, I, I thought about how to position this model that he mentioned in the, in the introduction in the concept of or construct of this VUCA world. We're going to say more about that in a minute. So we can run up to the next slide. Uh, I've, been, I've been actually coincidentally um, sort of graduated um, uh, from, from my master's program in 1987. And it's also the time that this term VUCA came into vogue. I think Warren Bennis and his associate, uh, who many of you probably studied, maybe coined it. But the US War College is the one that sort of made it famous. Um, this is when the USSR, the former Soviet Union, was beginning to wobble. And um, although most people thought that was helpful, it did create sort of a very unforeseen set of power dynamic shifting in the world. Maybe not unlike what's going on today, uh, this many years later, as we think about China and the role that China's playing in the world. But VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And I just sort of smile and maybe laugh a little to myself when I think if, if people thought 1987 was VUCA, oh my God, like 2022 looks you know, makes 87 look like a still life painting. I mean, you ain't seen nothing yet, as they say. And I remember many years ago when I was studying change, this guy told me um, the only constant in, uh, in change is that it, tomorrow will be more change than, than yesterday. And I remember thinking, yeah, maybe. And I, I think about that constantly right now, that the next year will be even more uncertain, even more volatile, even more complex, even more ambiguous than this year. And it just helps me to think about that. 
and it, it does, I don't feel victimized by that. I just sort of accept that as the reality and the era in which we're all uh, managing and leading HR. So if we go up to the next slide, um, Brad said all this very kindly, so I won't repeat it uh, other than to say, I, I've got a lot of great colleagues that I respect greatly and I learn from, I love my peer network. I love my friends that I've made over all this many years all over the world, frankly. Um, and so none of this is a brag sheet or sort of why you should listen to me. You won't find many like me though, um, who've sort of done it this long, first of all, who've done it in not just three companies, but really three industries, industrial, long cycle businesses, financial services, and consumer products, who've sort of laced that in with a pretty good amount of board service. And I really do, the thing that Brad said that made me the happiest was, I work really hard to try to give something back to this function that's given me so much. And um, these are just some of the ways I do that, but I budget in some time for myself, including a session like today, um, because uh, to help the next generation uh, come along and build on what me and my colleagues might have done is something I feel like is a really great use of time. So that's a little bit about me and maybe why Brad asked me to join and maybe why some of what I have to say uh, might be worth thinking about at, at the altitude of 20,000 feet. Next slide. Um, I've been using this slide for a while. If you've seen me, you'll smile and say, here he goes again. But I would say the original competency model for a world-class head of HR, you need to look no further than the Wizard of Oz. And to me, if I had 20 seconds to assess somebody and decide whether they might have the goods, I would look for somebody who's got in proportion the courage that the cowardly lion was looking for, the smarts that the scarecrow was looking for, and the heart that the, that the 10 man was looking for. And I'm sure that's not why uh, The Wizard of Oz was, was written and produced, but it's an interesting thing to think about because I would say these days, you need more courage than ever to do things that are not necessarily popular, but are very important. The smarts and the business acumen you need has never been greater until tomorrow when it'll be greater than it was today. And I try to remind myself that if I ever forget that my role, uh, the heart part of this job is to be in some cases, the conscience of the organization, to sometimes try to remind myself that we're talking about real people with real families and real struggles and real questions and real fears and real concerns. We're not just talking about investors and sort of money runners and, uh, and things like that. If I ever forget that, that I am the sole champion of that, that, and that employee population, I think it is time for me to stop doing what I'm doing right now. And I would just suggest that that's an important thing to remember. You can get swept away in all the business work and forget the fact that we are first and foremost here to make sure that we are standing up and, um, and supporting our employees as we lead them through this VUCA world. So just kind of the, 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 uh, the poor guy's version of a competence model, if you don't have the money or the time for any of it, you won't go too far wrong. If you, if you measure yourself against this model or you measure your successors against this model, I think it's a good place to start. Next slide. Um, I grew up in a time when HR was quite honestly looking for its voice and spent a lot of time wondering whether it had a seat at the table. It sort of suffered from a chronic inferiority complex, if you ask me. Um, it was transitioning from something that used to be called personnel, you know, into what is now called human resources. But even today, all that many years later, start this thing and run around from the 12 o'clock position. It is still true today that CEOs themselves, in many cases, I won't say most, but I will say many cases, are not clear what they need from a head of HR. I get calls from CEOs, most often because their board asks them to call me, and it goes something like this. Hey, Kevin, I'm not trying to recruit you, I promise, but so-and-so on our board said that you might help me think about whether I'm getting all that I should be getting out of my current head of HR. I'm actually not quite sure what I have a right to expect, and they said you might help me with that. 
funny they don't have that question about CFOs or heads of technology or heads of supply chain or heads of marketing or general counsels, but many of them continue to not know quite what they're looking for. So the role I think is misunderstood by the leader of the organization. You gotta fix that. Two o'clock position. So even if you're lucky enough to work in a place where the CEO gets the job and understands what it is and where it's going, your colleagues sometimes don't. Maybe they didn't grow up with that level of HR expertise and they wanna kind of keep it sort of back seat um, in the car, but not necessarily in the front seat of the car. I think one of the, I'll talk about this more in a minute. Um, the real head of HR role is not even clear to our direct reports because we don't spend that much time with our direct reports because we spend so much time elsewhere. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So even the people who work for me don't really understand what my days look like, what my weeks look like, and where I spend my time. Much of it is confidential. Much of it is, is, is very private. Um, and much of it cannot and should not be shared. So I'm not trying to be secret for the sake of being secretive. But I would say I do respect the sanctity of the boardroom and what goes on there, the sanctity of the executive suite and what goes on there, sort of only when we all agree what's ready to be shared with the broader organization, might I start to bring my direct reports into something like that. Search firms, headhunters, um, you know, you can imagine a guy that's been doing this for 24 years, gets lots of, um, hey, do you know anybody notes and calls from headhunters. Um, and when I say, well, send me the spec and I get it. And most often I'm really disappointed with the, how generic, how safe and how basic that is. And I say, if you don't even know what you're looking for, you have no great chance to find it in the marketplace. So have you done the hard work of contracting with that CEO to talk about what you're looking for? Go all the way back up to 12 o'clock. Maybe they have, but the CEO doesn't know. So the chance of getting it right um, is lower than it would be otherwise. Um, board members, thankfully, are beginning to catch on to the role and the value CHROs can add. I think that's really exciting. And then up at the uh, kind of 10 o'clock position, even if you understood it pretty well in 22 or 2019 or 2018, it's changing and it's dynamic. And so you might not understand it today or for tomorrow. So those are the conditions that really sort of exist that made us think we ought to think more about this. Next slide. As Brad mentioned uh, almost five years ago, a few of us got together and uh, decided we wanted to put this model together. I'm gonna show you one more slide in just a minute. Before I do that, the connection of this model or framework to the VUCA title of this presentation is intentional. I don't think we should ever have a cookbook or a recipe about how to be ahead of HR. It's too confining, it's too constraining, it takes away your business context, takes away your personality, takes away your unique talents and gifts. So as tempting as it can be sometimes to say, can you, can you really make this at a level of detail that's pretty prescriptive, go back with me to 20,000 feet. We don't think that's a great idea. So what we tried to create was a model, or you might be more comfortable using a framework that gives you enough structure, which we do think is really helpful, and allows you to decide with your leadership team, how should I adapt this structure to my situation? My business might be in a turnaround right now. So the model needs to be flexed to a turnaround. My, model, my business might be in a high growth orientation. I need to flex the model to a high growth orientation. My model be, might be under severe restructuring pressure and I might need to deal with that. My company might be European and I've got a different mix because of that. So the idea was kind of get this loose tight thing right, enough clarity to give direction and to give perspective, but not so much to choke the very important, it depends out of this. So that's what we're trying to do. Next slide. When we got together, we had a few um, important principles and uh, they're self-evident here. So I'm gonna go through this slide pretty quickly. One, this is freeware. So I encourage you to take this and disseminate it and use it and share it in your circles and in your network 
free of charge. It's the only way I would sign up for this. Nobody's looking to make a dollar out of this. Uh, I think one of the things that gets unfortunate is sometimes um, there are consultants and groups that try to do that. So they come up with competing models for the sake of maybe business development. That is, we are the anti-business development side of this. Um, our intent is we're trying to create a movement. We're trying to say, if we could, most of us uh, agree upon this model, we could spend all of our time, time trying to live up to it and get to it versus feeling like the goalposts keep changing every year, which gets confusing. So we're really trying to create this sort of open market freeware movement. That's this noble intent. That's the very talented Carol Surface there. She's the CHRO of Medtronic. Um, Carol was involved in the first uh, uh, 1.0 of this, and she was my co-part, she was my partner, my literal 50-50 partner in what we call chapter two. Um, she's just an example. This is not Kevin's show, and, and uh, although I certainly had a, um, a meaningful role in putting all this together, I had a lot of great help. And Carol is chief among equals in the, in the help that she provided there. Again, comes from a different industry and a different background. And I just really enjoy that kind of collaboration um, with Carol. Back when we put the model together, that's Omar Ishtak. He was the, was the CEO of, of Medtronic back then and was Carol's boss. He's gone on to do board work. He retired from Medtronic. Carol has a new CEO right now. But the important part is Omar wasn't the only CEO by, by a long shot that we spoke to. We in HR have a little bit of a tendency to be in our own echo chamber, like a meeting like this, talking amongst ourselves. And we can easily forget the importance of the fact that we do this with and for CEOs. And when we took our model and ran it through CEOs, they changed it. And those changes made it better. And we escaped our echo chamber when we did that. I think you, if you're not careful, you can get into opinion pieces in something like this. Everybody wants an article in the in a various uh, a magazine or journal. But um, as I'm sure the Cornell academics would, would support, to have some research under this so that it's not just an opinion piece gives it greater validity. It gives it greater staying power. It gives it greater um, utility. And so we were supported initially by CEB, uh, which Gartner acquired. And more recently, we've been supported by Gartner. So pick your reasons to do this, but there aren't many models out there that I would say check these four boxes of being free, being done with a vast amount of input from other heads of HR, being done with and developed with CEO input and supported by research in no particular order. So that's sort of the recipe that led, uh, led to this framework. Next slide. Um, I'm proud of the fact that that 2017 model stood the test of time. And I would look at it every year and people would say, you think you ought to change it. And I would say, hold, 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 watch, watch, watch. But one day it'll be time. And we decided in at the beginning of 2022 that this was a good year to look at it again. Not for any particular uh, anniversary reason, but we felt like enough had changed. Pandemic's a good example, but there are many other things that have happened since then. We thought we had to go back and refresh it. And the board that we worked for, the advisory board that we worked for, encouraged us to refresh it, not to reinvent it. They actually said much of it is very serviceable to this day, but there's an opportunity to refresh it. If we were software developers, I think we went from 1.0 to 1.1. We didn't go to 2.0. You know, this isn't a completely different uh, issuance. It's a refinement of, uh, of an operating model. Our principles were to focus on where we are spending our personal time and where we are spending our leadership capital. You know, what, wh where we are spending our time and the, uh, the political capital within our organization. And the third point is, which is one of the most difficult, is to guard against what I think time will prove out to be are temporary shifts. I'm not saying they're insignificant at all, but they're not permanent. As awful as the Russia-Ukraine war is, it will be over one day. And that won't fundamentally and permanently change the role of the head of HR. What you're dealing with right now, everything from relief efforts to how do you pay people? How do you live up to the sanctions? Are you gonna stay open in Russia? Are you gonna close in Russia? So I know you're dealing with that right now. 
That's not a model change. That's a trend. The pandemic isn't over, um, but it will be at some point. And again, we've been consumed by that um, and the implications of that on remote work as, as, a, as a research assistant is going to talk to you about. But again, that doesn't mean that the fundamental role of the head of HR has changed. It just means that we're working on things right now that are very important. It's so difficult to sort of get that focus right between sort of near here and now, near term, really important to your organization, what I would call more permanent changes to the way the role is evolving. And that's the needle that this chapter two group was asked to thread on this page. Next slide. Here it is, all in one page. I'm gonna unpack it for you. I promise I won't take 10 hours to do it, um, but I just wanna orient you to it. You can think about it as a Jeopardy board if you like game shows. You can think about it as a house if you're into that. Um, uh, whatever, whatever symbol you wanna use for this, I would ask you to read it from the bottom to the top. Like a house, we need a good solid foundation. And, and the stronger that foundation, you know, the higher and the stronger that house can be. So think about that. And also think about the, the roof line on this house, which says drive business results. You should never forget that we are here ultimately to drive business results in our company. We are not here for our own sake or we're not here for our own pride or our own egos. We are here to contribute in a meaningful way to the success of our companies. And although that might, you might say, Kevin, that's so obvious, just want to put it out there and I want to remind us that that really does matter. Um, we won't dwell too much on that one at all. If it's light blue, look up in the top left, that's changes to the model of world class CHRO 1.0. So you can see the headers, four of the headers did change and the content underneath that changed. Trusted advisor and coach stays in navy blue and it did not change. Um, and, uh, and so that is stable from, uh, from the first uh, 1.0 model. Um, business acumen, business strategy uh, on the mezzanine level did not change in a meaningful way, but we did add a couple pieces to the functional business leader, which I'm going to talk about here in just a minute. But I'm going to unpack this. We're going to go from the bottom to the top, and I promise I'm not going to cover all of the boxes here, just the navy blue ones at the bottom and the four or uh, five headers across the top. We'll spend a minute on trend watch list, and, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll wrap up. Okay, so next slide. Let's unpack. Um, we believe that the foundation of this is that we really have to think about our role to drive great business results as part of the role. I talked about that a minute ago. Um, we also understand that the best CHROs in the world today, this is not aspirational, the best CHROs in the world today know that business acumen is huge. I would say it's getting huger if that were a word, but, um, Whatever business acumen you might have needed, you're expected to know more and more about how your business operates today. If you want to be taken as seriously as I think we need to be taken, and if you want to participate in driving business results. Uh, a lot of us come into this function without sort of the, the, the strong business academic uh, preparation. That's okay, so did I. But with the right amount of focus and work, you too can be mistaken for somebody who often I hear, I had no idea you were an HR person. I thought you were a CFO, or I thought you were a CEO or something like that. There's nothing that makes me happier than when somebody makes that mistake about me, because it lets me know that I am a meaningful participant in the overall business, not simply a functional silo person. Um, business strategy development, which we can talk a little bit more about, is not HR strategy connected to the business. It literally is participating in the strategy and the future direction setting of your company. So if you have that seat at the table as a head of HR and you're gathered around, you have every right, and I would say you have a responsibility to play a meaningful role in helping that executive team come up with the right future for your organization. I once worked for a CEO who said, Kevin, one of your greatest advantages is your vantage point. 
He said, think about it like a football stadium. He said, um, you get to sit up in the coach's box and you get to sort of see how everything happens on the field. He said, that's a, that's a real advantage. He said, if you're playing the game and you're on the field, you don't see everything. He said, but your ability to sort of see how the organization is working, the offense, the defense, the special teams, whatever that might be, is a gift. Use it. You know, you sit on the 50-yard line, if you're talking about American football, um, you sit on the 50-yard line you, and you sit in the coach's box, and you see things we don't see. You see things the quarterback doesn't see. And he goes, and, and it's not just that you see it, it's what do you do with that knowledge to help our team win? And that was an important conversation that happened for me 20 years ago, but I still think about today. It's a gift where we operate and let's do something meaningful with that gift. So contributing to business strategy comes from, you know, you might say, well, I'm not the greatest strategist in the world or I'm, I'm no financial expert. True, but you see how the team is performing relative to the current strategy and you have perspective, altitude, back to 20,000 feet. That's another way of expressing the same thing. You see the field differently. And once you've seen it, you'll never see it the same way again. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, if we could just go back one, let me just uh, hit that last point. That's an important one. Remember a couple minutes ago, I was talking about how sometimes even our direct reports as heads of HR don't know what we do. Well, the corollary to that is, goodness gracious, if that's the case, do we ever need really strong seconds or number twos? Do we really need super great total reward heads, super great talent heads, super great HR business partners? I could kind of go down the, the functional line there. Um, we absolutely do because I count on that team, my lieutenants, if you will, to be the leaders of the vast majority of the HR organization. And I'm not checked out or divorced from that, but the amount of time that we have to spend with that group is much smaller than new CHROs think it would be. It could be 10%. So if it's 10% because I'm spending 90% elsewhere, number one, I need to make every percent of that 10 count. Number two, I need to count on a team that sort of takes that vision, takes that strategy and leads their organization really, really well. So that's the functional business leader part. We did add, in the lighter blue there, technology we're in operationally capable. You know, we, we have learned that we really do have to be more digitally savvy, that our user experiences need to be better, that uh, we are spending a lot of money in people operations or shared services or whatever your model might be. And we need to be operationally quite capable about that. It's not enough to be sort of only the, the strategist. We, we are operators. Uh, increasing with really large, significant budgets and lots and lots of people. And we need to make sure that that is recognized in this model. So sorry I missed that point. It's a really important one and, uh, and I'm going to go back to it. Now we can move on. Okay, um, I'm going back to the slide, the, the, the house slide, and I'm going left to right in terms of uh, a couple key points. The first one, we updated this column talking about the board and CEO's leader of human capital and culture. Um, first of all, we want to make sure that human capital and culture are both elevated and they are now in the province, they've always been the province of CEOs, but I would tell you that if you spend much time in a publicly traded company boardroom, you are spending more and more time with directors who are more and more interested in culture. I didn't always take it as seriously as I should have, but one of the things 24 years teaches you is culture. Uh, like wind for a pilot, uh, you can't see wind, but it's very important to how you fly a plane safely. Well, culture is very important to how you run a company successfully. And I've come to really appreciate that. And I wanna make sure that we're thinking more and more about that every day. We've talked in the first model about CEO succession. Well, increasingly, not only is CEO succession important, but other C-suite, C-level roles in the succession planning there, very important to a board of directors. And again, very much consistent with the intersection of talent and business strategy. If your company needs to become more digital and less analog, then you need to think about C-suite leadership in the future that might have some of those skills 
themselves. They might bring more of that native talent with them. Uh, that's an example of that. So however you define critical role in your organization, succession planning needs to evolve beyond just the CEO, which is hard enough to another, uh, another set of, of key members. Um, effective compensation supported by shareholders. We used to talk about executive compensation. Well, um, governance uh, mavens are spending a lot more time thinking about your overall compensation. And, um, and your overall compensation schemes. And do you have, go back to Wells Fargo from several years ago, Wells Fargo got in severe trouble by not their executive comp programs only, but how they were incenting branch managers and, and uh, people at, at the, uh, more at the ground level of that organization to sell and cross sell products that they didn't necessarily need. That's an example of you know risk that we take in broader, sales incentive programs becoming a bigger subject in a boardroom and not being something that boards no longer uh, care about. Just one example, there are many others. And I think we talked enough about culture though. I would tell you that if uh, your workforce is, is dealing with the next generation of entrants, they are very, very focused on purpose and very, very focused on the purpose of the company, how that connects to the culture of the company and how that connects to, to them uh, uh, relative to their engagement. So all these things become, uh, in my mind, boardroom subjects, have become boardroom subjects. Our model needs to reflect. Next slide. I don't know if the great resignation is over. I feel like it is. I think that might have come and gone as the economy stiffens and people are, um, hey, Brad, just let me check. I got a warning that my internet might not be stable. Are you still here and see me okay? Yeah, you're going, cutting in and out a little bit, Kevin, but I think you're you're back. And just for a second there. All right, wave, wave your hand, wave your hand if, uh, if, I'm, if I'm off, I'll uh, see what I can do here. Um, dynamic talent landscape is, um, is, is a safe term for what's happening right now, whether we're through the great resignation or not. It is just constantly changing. You talk about VUCA, what people want, what they expect, uh, the, the, um, the complexity of that seems to rise daily. And we wanna make sure that this model reflects that. So whether it's making sure you've got the right talent in your critical roles, very importantly, embedding D, E, and I, into and really uh, interspersing that with your talent culture strategy. And however you do this, making sure that the reason to come to work at your company is clear and it's compelling. You know that people have more information they've ever had, greater transparency than they've ever had. Uh, there was a day when Glassdoor was a big deal. Well, there, there are many ways that people can kind of get to the truth of what is it like to work in your company. And you need to make sure that the sizzle kind of matches the steak. And, um, and so it's a very dynamic talent landscape. And we want to make sure that we, um, uh, recognize it in the model. Next slide. I think this is the single biggest change to the model, honestly, enterprise strategic change. Now this has got two dimensions to it. One of them is the role that we ourselves play in advocating, driving, leading change, sometimes agitating for change. If we don't do that, who will? Remember the vantage point, remember 20,000 feet, remember where you sit in the football stadium. You know, we see things and we need to go quite often to our CEOs and say, we need to change this. This is where the cowardly line comes in because the CEO often says, I don't want to change it. And it's our job to sort of create a compelling business case as to why that change is necessary. Why might we need to destabilize the organization in order to come out of it stronger? Risky stuff takes a lot of courage. So that's one dimension what we ourselves do, but we don't do it entirely ourselves and we shouldn't do it entirely ourselves. So are we creating organizational agility and are we creating leaders who have a greater change IQ than they used to have, who know how to not only drive change that they wanna lead, but sometimes manage the change that the top of the house wants to lead. Are we developing that? Is that being baked into our leadership development experiences so that people are as agile as they need to be in this VUCA world? 
are we thinking about, um, again, competition changes daily. It is so much more sophisticated now who your competitors likely are. You've got the tried and true big companies you've always been stalking, but you've got, you know, two folks in a garage that are trying to destabilize you in, in very interesting ways. And you've got to be aware of that and make sure that your organization knows how to compete with that as well as the traditional competitors. And then how do you sustain that change? One of the things I really, really roll my eyes on here at GE is when our organization, including some of our HR folks, if I'm honest, think that the change ends the day that the announcement comes out, like the, the organizational change comes out. Maybe it's a company with a PowerPoint deck that says, here's how the new organization is gonna be structured. And we sort of go, change complete, let's move on to the next thing. And you know, if you're honest with yourself, that that didn't do anything. It, it, it provided sort of a, here's where we're going, but that's not managing and that's not creating sustainable change. That's just making an announcement. We need to do a much better job of, of lining up all the levers that we have control of. You know, in my case, compensation levers, communication levers, culture levers, performance appraisal culture, uh, levers, training levers. I mean, I have, or my organization has control over so many things that can either enable and sustain that change or confuse it if we don't get all that aligned. So we spend a lot of our time trying to think about the orchestration and the symphony that we're trying to create when we do this. That's leading enterprise strategic change. Next one. Another big change. Wow, has it gotten noisy out there. Evolving stakeholder scenarios. You know, maybe I used to pay attention to my employees, hopefully. Maybe if I had labor unions, I thought about that. But now, um, a whole lot of third party stakeholder scenarios. It could be activist investors, it could be regulators, it could be politicians, it could be employee uh, advocacy groups in your own organization, um, it could be the media. Um, but there are a lot of external factors going on, sort of putting pressure on an organization. And you can think about ESG here very naturally. You know, you're getting pressure, your CEO is getting pressure to take a stand on gun control or take a stand on Roe v. Wade's overturning or take a stand on Russia, Ukraine. Um, how do you think about that? How do you help your CEO and your organization think about that? Lots and lots of response to external trends. Our job is to deal with them ideally to even anticipate them uh, because these are complicated subjects that are very tough to do over a weekend. Making sure that we align our organizational metrics to the stakeholder expectations. When we talk to proxy advisors, they are increasingly pushing us to add more metrics. So in the US, the uh, SEC is probably gonna come out one day soon with their human capital scorecard and things that we think we need to make sure that we are tracking and measuring, and then it's just a very small baby step toward are you paying for those things? And when you pay for those things, you know, you are diluting what you're currently paying for. So you've got to navigate all of that. And just remember the workforce is your primary stakeholder, back to the 10 man and the who's looking for the heart, making sure that that workforce is the stakeholder that you as the head of HR are most concerned about. So you've got to keep all this in balance. But evolving stakeholder scenarios is the point. And the fact is, it's going to continue to change. And I worry the most about uh, heads of HR who are in some form of denial about this. And they wonder whether this is just a blip or just a temporary change. And I would say with my years of experience, this is a permanent change. And uh, the exact stakeholder mix will vary company to company and year to year. But to, to think more externally is the bigger idea here. And think more about a very sophisticated stakeholder map that your company is dealing with, whether you're on point for it or not. Next one. Um, this is the sexiest part of the job for a lot of people. It's the last person in the room, in the room when it happens, if you're a Hamilton fan, trusted advisor and coach, not just to the CEO, but to the senior team. And it's a job that most of us are actually quite good at by the time we get here. We enjoy it and it's very, very important. 
So I'm not going to spend any time here just because that's been true forever for, for probably all 24 of my years, if not longer. And it continues to be true today. It's very critical. It's largely unchanged. Um, the one point I would make is it's not enough to only focus on the CEO and the coaching to the CEO. I've made a few big mistakes in my life. And the biggest one that I can think of was in my first CHRO job, I didn't understand this. And for reasons that I felt were noble and, and, and important, I was obsessed with the coaching and the relationship with the CEO. And I did not think enough about the effect that had on my peers and on the senior team. And although I meant well, I think my obsession with, with that relationship and maybe even my insecurity as a new CHRO caused me not to think enough laterally and it hurts the team. And so I vowed never to make that mistake again. One of the things you learn as a pilot is you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. The idea is not to make the same one twice. And uh, being ahead of HR uh, reminds me a lot of that. Trusted advisor and coach. Next slide. You can call this a parking lot if you want. Um, uh, a, a great big post-it note, but um, we do think that this model should be constantly tracking things that come in that are new and evaluating what's a trend versus a permanent change. And so here's our current trend watch list, but it will change. It's designed to be kind of a holding pattern so that when it's time for the next refreshment of this model, we have a place to start. Talked about ESG a minute ago. Uh, you know, and any company that you're working with, there's this really interesting intersection between people, process, and technology. What does that mean for the future of work? Managing reality of flexible work environments. I am not ready to say that hybrid work is gonna be a permanent change, but I am willing to say it will never be quite like it was before the pandemic. Um, I just feel like that ship has sailed and it's gonna be a matter of degrees. How do you think about that? If we're all uh, dealing with this technology change, how are we dealing or are we dealing with workforce skill development? What is our responsibility to our workforce if they become obsolete? Always a question, a bigger question right now, given the pace and rate of change in the VUCA world. And then what's the role of analytics and decision-making? You know, Are we still working too much on our gut? Is there room for greater uh, data and, and, and greater facts to help guide these really tricky decisions? That's an example of trend watch list. Come up to the next one. So as you can imagine, I'm fond of this model. I've been fond of it since 2017. I'm really, really proud to introduce this chapter two. But really quickly, my seven favorite use cases are here and I won't spend a lot of time on all this. I'm watching the clock, Brad. But um, a great example of how to use this is you're a great head of HR, but you just got a new CEO. And we know that the sort of the life expectancy of the CEO is probably four years these days. So the chances are high, you're gonna get one. So a great opportunity to come into a new CEO and say, let's use this to contract on your expectations versus mine. Really safe, really easy way to do that. You might have your, maybe your CEO hasn't changed, but you wanna elevate. You feel like you're in the back seat and you wanna get into the front seat of the organization. This is a way to kind of climb that value add stack. When I have a board of director, a new board of director that I'm going through orientation with, I spend time on this model because I want them to know how they can think about me, how they can utilize me and how we might be able to partner together. So a great uh, way to fold this in a new director orientation. Um, we're all thinking about our successor. And so this is a great development tool for people who wanna be ahead of HR one day. Very adaptable to BU or division heads of HR. There's a lot of public company stuff embedded in this, uh, but you can very easily turn this model into something that is just as relevant for a head of HR at a division level. Helping a CEO or search firm go beyond sort of comp and talent, which is where they usually start with CHROs uh, to this broader subject we touched on. We're educating the executive leadership team on what we do. I share this with my CFO. I share this with my general counsel because I want them to understand what they have a right to expect from me and out of me, for example. So these are seven, there are more, but they're my favorite use cases just as you think about what you might do with this model. Next slide. I'm coming down the home stretch here. And so um, if you'll tolerate a, an, old, an old crusty guy for just a couple more minutes, 
when I think back on this VUCA world and some maybe enduring leadership lessons I just want to leave you with, I'm going to stay right here on this slide. The essence of leadership, and I learned this from another CEO I work for, is as simple and as hard as this phrase, define reality and give hope. I think great leaders need to do both. We need to be honest and transparent enough to define reality, but we can't stay there. We also need to give hope. Why will the future be better? Why will this be more compelling? If we just give hope and don't define reality, we're dreamers and we've untethered ourselves from reality and we're not credible. So this balance about defining reality and give hope has come in so handy to me over the years. It's just a really enduring lesson of leadership. Um, I love peers and I love peer learning and I do understand the next generation is obsessed with peer learning. But I would say if you wanna be ahead of HR one day, the counsel of those who've gone before you is essential. It's not just interesting or helpful, it's essential. And um, there are many places you can turn for what I would call judgment advice. How would you think about this? Did you ever face this before? Um, I'm a big fan of that. And part of and, and older, more experienced, and in many cases, retired people are a really important part of my network. Don't give up on guys like us who've kind of been there and done that, because I think there's something that we can add and contribute. My star sign is a Libra which means uh, I seek balance everywhere I can. I'm allergic to hype. Um, things are rarely as good as you think they are, and it's rarely as bad as you think they are. Most of it is sort of in the middle of the road, the fairway, or as a pilot, uh, the center line of the runway. I try really hard to subtract drama, and in a VUCA world, there is no shortage of drama. I try to take it away versus add to it. We talked about exit, um, your echo chamber. You know, if you're really addicted to social media, you spend a lot of time there. Um, you can get into a very, very narrow band of, you know, your influencers and your perspectives. Um, so I try very hard intentionally to read things from authors I don't agree with or follow people that I don't care for or naturally align to because I want to understand how everyone thinks about problems, not just how my squad thinks about problems or opportunities. And I have no idea is a perfectly good answer from time to time. You know, uh, it is hard to predict the future. Probably it's impossible to predict the future, but you can scenario plan. It could go this way. And if it does, this is what we'll do. It could go this way. This is what we'll do. Go this way. This is what we'll do. Put your value there versus here's what's going to happen. And here's how we have a plan for it. Because it's really tough to do that in a VUCA world and to do that with accuracy. And if you miss it, you give up your credibility. Like they say in the airlines, you know, put your oxygen mask on first so you can help others take care of yourself. Think about how you nourish and how you give yourself oxygen so that you can be a better leader is a good way to think about it. And um, with that, uh, if we run to the next slide. Don't think we have time for Q&A in the classic sense, Brad. I can't see the chat from my screen, but um, I'm also sensitive that he asked me to cut off at two o'clock and it's two o'clock. Do you have a minute or two, Kevin? I do. Okay, so we had a couple questions come in so we can tackle them. Just wanna thank you for a great presentation. And I'll just say up front, you know, to add to your use cases, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of the 1.0 framework, even here at Cornell and our executive education programs as we're talking to people who aspire to that role. It's really been helpful for us to kind of give them the framework to kind of give them a mental model of what the role entails, as well as some of the assessment tools that you've built around it. So thanks for your work and updating. I'm sure we'll continue to leverage it uh, here. So just a, a couple quick questions. You know, one that came in early in your presentation was, you know, your thoughts on where HR professionals should focus in next year in respect to their own skills and development and related to that what expectations do you set in your organization for their own learning for among your kind of reports i think i'm going to start with business acumen um as as you heard me wax on about that a little bit but i would say if unless you're really confident and really comfortable there it is a no regrets move it is a no regrets move to obsess about the earnings um, calls that your company does that are publicly recorded and available to you, you got to be on those calls and listening. You got to be reading the, the reports. You got to be reading your analyst reports. You got to be able to understand what your CEO is navigating because that's 
the tip of the spear that you're quite often going to ultimately be asked to respond to. So business acumen, if I had one thing to think about, Brad, it would be that. Um, the, the other thing is um, I would hover on that external stakeholder development. You know, think, think about how your sources of information and what, what your feeds look like. And are you really plugged into these external factors that are more than likely affecting your company? The two ideas. Great. So another one, Kevin, was, you know, what is your process for onboarding yourself to a new company or a new role? You talked a lot about how the framework can be used to help set expectations of others, but what's the, what should the responsibility of the person that's coming into the new role, you know, what should they be focusing on? Be an obsessive listener. Um, you know, there's different ways to do this. Some people, a, a CEO told me one time, I take a hundred days, literally, and I put it on my calendar when day 101 is on my calendar. And I tell people I'm not going to do anything major. Don't expect me to make any big moves, any big announcements. But I'm going to really, really study and learn this organization. Because I don't want to bring, you know, what I did at my prior company in without the context of where I am today. So I'm a big, big fan of a meaningful listening tour. Not check the box, but literally, you know, what do I need to understand about this organization? You may not have 100 days if your house is on fire, but you, sh you should give yourself some of that time to immerse yourself in the new organization and think about that. That's the single most important thing that I, I would suggest. Great, and so maybe one more quick one, and this is my own. As a fellow Libra, I was really intrigued by your idea of not over-rotating on hyper trends. And you, know, you made the point throughout around what's a permanent shift versus just maybe a temporary trend and i'm just curious like how what's your litmus test for deciphering between those or how have you managed that throughout your career it's hard um i'll, I'll acknowledge that but there are a couple of things i i look brad for enduring truths things that i i would say have always been true and i would predict always will be true so for example great leadership has always mattered in 1943, it mattered. In 1983, it mattered. In 2023, it's going to matter. So those kinds of things are, doesn't matter whether you're on the West Coast in a tech-driven company, or you're in an older industrial company, or you're in a, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Great leadership is an enduring truth. So I think about that, and I put a trend up against that. Does it tell me something? Does it challenge that or not? The second one is, I think people care about growth, development, and stability. And even when the gig economy was sort of hyped and was coming out, I'm like, yeah, I think there's a part of my life where a gig economy might have worked out okay. But eventually, I think I would probably be looking for stability. Now, that might be when I have a family, or that might be when I kind of need some steady, predictable income. So I'm not denying that that era exists for people, but I would say to believe that the whole world is going to go to a gig economy struck me as hyperbolic. And so I, I go back to that. And the third one is um, experience to me is, is still the best teacher. And no matter what we think about, um, I just think there's a lot to be learned from experience. It, you shouldn't be um, you know, so connected to it, you can't escape it, but you ought to go back and ask yourself, what have I learned about this subject and really reflect on that those little hedges kind of help me filter height and it's not perfect, but those are some of the ways that I try to think about it. Great insight and advice. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for hanging on with us for a few uh, minutes. I'm sure the, the framework, again, will be widely used and widely, wi widely influential like the first one. We really appreciate you walking through it with us today. Brad, thanks for CARS and, and the school's endorsement of the model and its use of it. I really do appreciate that. That's that's part of the movement we're trying to create, so I'm grateful for that. And I want to wish you and uh, everybody on the call a terrific holidays and uh, a very happy and healthy 2023. Thank you for having me. Same to you. Take care, Take Kevin. Care. All right. So now up, we have our uh, Mylar uh, research assistants who will be kind of uh, going from the 20,000 foot level that Kevin was at, really kind of drilling down into to some of the current issues and challenges that HR leaders are facing today, uh, specifically around the context of remote and hybrid uh, work. 
So um, let me quickly introduce our three presenters. Uh, first up, we have Holly Harmon, who is a second year graduate student here uh, in our Mylar program. She's a passionate member of the ILR community as obviously one of our CARS uh, research assistants, but also the ILR graduate, a student association president, and also a teaching assistant for the workplace disability and inclusion course. This summer, she interned with PepsiCo and prior to coming to Cornell, she had received an undergraduate degree at Western Michigan University in 2020, majoring in human resources and business analytics, as well as did research there as well. Next up, we have Dan Miller, um, also one uh, student in the Mylar program. Uh, he attended Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts as a business major and graduated in 2011. After graduation, he worked for 10 years in the tech industry, starting with a small uh, startup, followed by IBM as a business analyst, and then as an internal consultant at Altisource, a financial technology company. This summer, he had the pleasure of supporting the DNI team at Train Technologies and is now entering his fourth and final semester as a Mylar. He's still exploring post-graduation options, but is excited to get back to work. See, school's not always that easy. Rashi Vora is a second year uh, Mylar candidate set to graduate in December. Prior to joining ILR, she earned her bachelor's in business administration from NMIMS University and a master's in commerce in Mumbai, India. She started her career in M&A and valuations advisory with Deloitte and then shifted gears to transition into organizational consulting, focusing on leadership and organization development. This summer, she interned with Cummings in their Center of Excellence and will join their functional HR excellence team post-graduation. Thanks to the three of you for joining us and for all of your work this semester, and we're looking forward to hearing your insights. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Brad, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We're so excited to share uh, our findings from the fall 2022 benchmarking study. Uh, we wanted to really understand talent strategies in an ever-changing work environment. As Dan mentioned, uh, I had the pleasure of working with Dan Miller and Holly Harmon. All three of us are Mylar students at, the, at Cornell University in our final year. So the agenda for today is first, we're gonna start to just understand the focus of our study and then dive into returning to work and the implications of modality on work. Uh, then we're gonna understand impact on talent strategy and the changes that we've observed in leadership capabilities. And we wanted to end with some big picture implications and considerations for the future. We'll also have some time for Q and A towards the end. So something we were really curious to understand is that with the pandemic, there's been a lot of change in employee expectations, the way work means to them and what value it adds to their lives. But at the same time, there have been stagnant or more increasing operational pressures on business strategy. So leadership has been uh, you know, playing a balancing act in this situation. And we really wanted to understand how companies are rethinking their talent strategy to remain competitive as they navigate a post-pandemic work environment. Some of the topics of focus for our study are work modalities, pain points faced, leadership capabilities, and some overall theme. So for the study, we had the uh, privilege to partner with 16 partner companies. We conducted 15 interviews and also had a quantitative survey to support it. We got an opportunity to speak to 35 plus leaders in different uh, talent strategy uh, spaces. And we're so grateful for learning more about how they're navigating this change. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Holly, who's going to help us understand returning to work and the implications of modality. Thank you so much. So in this section, we're going to focus on modalities across organizations, hybrid as the newest normals, as well as additional themes that we have gained from the data as well as the interviews. So modalities across organizations, we saw that 100% of surveyed companies are keeping some type of new work modality. 
So they're rethinking what flexibility means to different groups, and they're redefining teamwork, productivity, and connection. As you can see from this chart, only three out of 16 organizations kept the same work modalities as they had in the pandemic. So we are seeing a return to more in-person modalities compared to what we were doing during the pandemic, which was in many ways, mostly virtual. So we've also seen that hybrid is the newest normal. We talked about change in the previous presentation, change is continuing to happen. So as of right now, hybrid is here. Post-pandemic work modalities are being dominated by hybrid work. No two organizations have the same hybrid experience. One organization may allow for considerable flexibility for their employees, and another organization may have more uh, considerable policy in place and may have a different definition for what hybrid is for them. Employees understand this difference and they're communicating their current wants and needs in regards to that hybrid experience that will support their work and life. And then least impacted were the manufacturing plant and field employees who a large component of their job is in person. This pie chart just shows that out of all the organizations that we connected with in this uh, study, the majority said that hybrid was dominating their different job groups across their organization. So as we were speaking with the different organizations that were navigating new modalities, we saw three different types. Type one offered hybrid work modalities as a differentiating option for its talent before the COVID pandemic, but now they have lost that advantage. Their critical consideration is to continue to further develop unique employee experiences moving forward. The second type of organization implemented new work modalities and is now focused on aligning its employee value proposition with its business strategy. And their consideration is to measure the impact of these changes to their talent strategy overall. And then the third type of organization struggled to effectively align its talent strategy with the conflicting interests of its management and employees. We believe that they need to utilize data to make a choice on modality and enact it with a clear communication strategy. So many organizations currently are dealing with, should we be hybrid? Should we be in person? What is best for us? And we understand that some organizations will be more successful with meeting their business goals if they do have most of their workforce in person or different groups in person. We have found that successful return to the office strategy is focused on intentionality, connection, and how that relates to the core mission of the organization. We also have found that in-office events may bring people back for a day, but these strategies are not successful long-term. And then there is also a major disconnect between what leaders and employees believe is the needed modality for the success of the company, and that's creating a major pain point. And then in addition, we found that a lack of data regarding productivity and performance is leading to inaction. So our hybrid work elements of success, we found that there are three successful elements that different organizations have been utilizing in different ways to support these changes in work experiences. So number one, reliable and consistent technology. Obviously, the many organizations that are on the call are using technology in different ways, but finding the right type of technology technological support platforms, as well as tools are really important to be successful in this changing environment. Next are in-person orientation for new employees. Some organizations are doing the first week is like a get together at a corporate location where they connect with employees, they connect employees to the goal of the organization. And other organizations are saying for the first couple of months to year, the employee should be in person to really gain an understanding of culture, the mission, and connect with different employees in the organization. And finally, we found that really successful organizations who've been navigating these changes have consistent communication across all levels. Where they had pain points was if they were uh, making it so that like middle managers were feeling 
a pressure to communicate these changes to their employees, whereas really successful organizations had clear plans on how they were going to break the communication of different modalities and changes to their employees. So next, Rashi is going to talk about the impact on talent strategy. Thanks, Holly. So now that we've got like a pulse check on seeing how organizations are looking forward with their work modalities, let's see how that has implications on talent strategy. So we're going to talk about the top pain points across different levels of employees, the implications on the talent strategy, and we specifically wanted to zoom in on the implications for manufacturing and plant groups. Uh, from a survey, we recognize different pain points across different levels of employees. The first and major pain point for senior leaders feel in manufacturing, and as you can see, consistent across all levels has been talent acquisition. With senior leaders, we see their role is much more demanding, and there's a lot of um, burnout at that level, and it's been difficult to attract talent for that reason. So feel in manufacturing, as Holly mentioned earlier, it's also the lack of flexibility and the, uh, because of the lack of flexibility, it's been difficult to get talent uh, because talent for that reason. And with retention and engagement, these are other two areas where there's been a lot of pain points across levels. Retention is something that as we might, uh, as we might expect from the great resignation, it's been difficult to retain talent uh, because of the um, amount of opportunities available. Engagement is an era where we've seen a lot of change, which we'll dive deeper into, essentially because companies are still learning how to engage employees and permeate their culture from a distance. And lastly, rewards and pay has been an issue for manufacturing and plant groups because of the competitive pressures provided by tech companies. So really diving into the implications on talent strategy, for engagement, that's been an area of the most change in talent strategy. That's reflected in the chart here as well, where you can see that there's been a lot of experimentation and a steep learning curve because companies are still trying to understand how to permeate their culture from a distance. Compensation is another area where there's been a lot of change, essentially because it's being used as a tool to retain high potential employees. It's also used to attract talent for roles which are completely in person and might not provide that flexibility. And lastly, something that you found very interesting is implications on performance management. While there's no change in the way people assess performance, there has been training implications for managers to evaluate outcome versus attendance. Something where we see that there will be a lot of change ahead is learning how to measure outcomes for knowledge workers where it might not be a very traditional way to do so. And lastly, we really wanted to zoom in on the manufacturing and plant groups because companies are recognizing the shifting gears in manufacturing. Some of the challenges that they're facing is talent acquisition and retention, as I mentioned earlier, but also the inequity in benefiting of from the EVP of flexibility. If the organization really prides itself on the flexibility it provides to its employees, and it doesn't translate to this particular group, it causes inequity in the experience that different employees have in your organization. So for this, these are some of the tried and tested remedies that have worked for companies. Really e rethinking the EVP and how it means for this group. The one size fits all approach might not work very well anymore and thinking about how you can provide stronger benefits, more opportunities for career growth and transitions uh, to really move from non-exempt to exempt roles and give them the trajectory that they require is helpful. Additionally, there are companies are really using a lot of different models of hybrid work for this group, like four-day work week, split shifts, etc. And we see that this is also an area of experimentation where there will be some change in the next few years. And with that, I hand it over to Dan to take us through the changes in leadership capabilities. Thanks, Rashi. Perfect. So we've observed new approaches to building leadership capabilities which suit emerging work arrangements, specifically concerning adaptability, new leadership expectations, and all levels of leadership serving as culture ambassadors for new and old employees. 
Across the board, adaptability emerged as the most impactful leadership capability, followed closely by a diversity mindset and empathy. A key differentiator we've seen in great leaders is the ability to view challenges as opportunities to improve and learn. They need to challenge their assumptions around success, and the most effective leaders in adapting to change are those who view failures as opportunities to learn from mistakes and use that learning to drive improvements the next time around. Adaptability is a critical capability for any employee, but we saw that it was particularly important for those that are leading others and an organization through ever-changing contexts. Naturally, leadership expectations have changed as well. Novel leadership development approaches for senior and regional leaders focus on gaining critical mass of adaptable leaders with a diversity mindset and an empathetic approach. However, these leaders face unprecedented time management requirements, overwhelming collaboration pressures, and not only employee burnout, but their own burnout challenges as well. Although some cha changes have occurred at the manufacturing level, they were understandably least impacted by new, new work modalities. However, we did hear about some emerging developments focused on improving equity. With the changing models and meaning of socialization at work, leaders play an even greater role in being proponents of culture and how work is done. Many successful organizations trained middle managers and frontline managers as culture ambassadors and were quick to develop culture permeation training for new employees. In addition, we found that these organizations provided simple yet effective trainings focused on things like how to work remotely or how to lead remotely. And ultimately, we found that productivity and business results were not impacted by work modality. However, we did see productivity that productivity paranoia was present, which is the disconnect between how much people say they're working and how much leaders think they're working. The organizations that communicated the best flex work outcomes focused on enabling essential collaboration while removing productivity paranoia. We found that organizations enable essential collaboration, which is the most important type of collaboration in hybrid and remote work settings by implementing work modality policies that encourage employees to develop and mobilize a broad network of connections for innovation and the ability to scale their work regardless of physical location. They also create energy and engagement in their networks so opportunities and talent flow freely. We also find renewal through personal connections that increase physical and mental well being. As we look towards the future, we analyzed both survey and interview data and develop some insights to help guide a path forward into the future of work. We found that the top post-pandemic talent strategies were developed with intentionality in the design and execution by aligning both HR strategy to firm competitive advantage, as well as firm strategy we found that many organizations that did that had, were superior at responding to changing conditions on the ground and to cultural differences across the globe. One large multinational firm we interviewed continued their hybrid slash remote working modalities because they saw better business results and employee engagement over the pandemic. For them, it wasn't about individual flexibility so much as they wanted to make their teams as effective as possible and they found that Work modality being team specific was the most impactful. From our conversations, we also learned a lot about the change in the employee employer relationship. There's been a reprioritization of work, and the meaning that work provides and the fulfillment that it provides to you has been changing. There are also a lot of alternate revenue streams and gig works which might provide flexibility to different tiers of employees. On the plus side, the pandemic has also humanized leadership. Everyone gets the same place in the box. So essentially, all of these elements have changed the employee-employer relationship. So let's see the implications of those. Reinforcing values and mission-centric organizations have really been able to create that sense of community and purpose and provide that stability and something to look forward to while working in unstable times like we face today. Using technology as a tool to really rethink socialization, which might be missing in hybrid and remote work, is a key area where companies can 
uh, improve on. We've seen some companies really use AI, VR, et cetera, to rethink their socialization efforts. Moreover, the halo effect of tapping into employer experience by investing in events, investing in diversity and inclusion, investing in that purpose has a lot of long-standing impacts, which can be seen in the next two years. And most importantly, something that's come through uh, through various conversations is the importance of middle managers being the proponents of culture. They are the ones who actually interact with employees and can give them the experience which the senior leaders are trying to accumulate towards the employees. So really focusing on how to develop that middle managers and training them is key. And then finally, there's some discussions that are had regarding equity and how hybrid work has impacted that. Hybrid work has created greater autonomy and flexibility and allows individuals to better balance their work and personal lives. In addition, it removes long commutes and costs, which can be especially burdensome for women and people with disabilities. So what we've seen is this has actually made it easier for underrepresented groups in the workplace and in leadership to succeed. And to wrap things up, here are a couple of our final takeaways. We had an incredible opportunity to meet with a vast array of HR leaders across many different organizations uh, and many different industries. And these four kind of takeaways we wanted to leave First, hybrid work may become a, a dominant work modality of the employee work experience for office jobs in general. And we think that as an emerging research and new talent strategies develop, it's not going to impact productivity, it's not going to impact business results, and it will give flexibility to the new generations that are entering the workplace. While talent acquisition, retention, and engagement remain key pain points for organizations across multiple industries, firms are leveraging work modality and emerging research to attract and retain key talent while continuing to win in the marketplace. In addition, adaptability is a critical leadership capability that organizations must develop and will support leaders and employees through uncertainty. And finally, agile leadership, resiliency, and a dynamic employee value proposition strategy are crucial for organizational success. With that being said, we would like to open the floor to questions. Great, thanks so much, Holly, Dan, Rashi. Great presentation, great work, lots of excellent insights in there. Had a couple questions come in already to our audience. I would certainly encourage you to submit any questions that you have, and we'll uh, tackle those in the, the time we've set aside here for uh, Q and A. So, you know, one question, you know, kind of links back to the first presentation by Kevin, where he kind of talked about, you know, hybrid work. Maybe not being convinced that it's here to stay, or it's going to be the kind of dominant work model going forward. You know, so based on your research, you know, how do you think about hybrid work in the sense of competitive advantage and also what it means for companies that maybe choose not to embrace it, you know, either in the short term or the long term, whichever you'd like to comment on? Yeah, I think one of the things that we found um, was that regardless of work modality, regardless of physical location, the most important element when it came to being intentional around telling employees where they should work or allowing them to choose where they work was aligning that intention with what you're trying to get out of those employees. And so when it comes to knowledge workers, where measuring productivity isn't as easy as, you know, counting the number of widgets that get created over a period of time, um, in those scenarios, oftentimes knowledge workers are being tracked against objectives or you know, hitting targets for completing projects and that sort of thing. And if they're able to hit those, those targets and accomplish their objectives, regardless of where they are, that should factor into to whatever policy you're choosing. If you want to, to have people in the office and you, you've aligned that with your core strategy, your talent strategy, and, um, you know, everything associated with that, it, it can make sense. However, um, it may cause uh, younger generations to think twice or th 
think uh, uh, differently about um, a particular opportunity. We just thought that it was most important that when you're designing that work modality, you're just being intentional and you're getting exactly what you want out of it. In addition, uh, we saw that for the companies that participated specifically in the study, there was no intention, a great intention to change what their current modality setup is, which as you could see a considerable number of those organizations that were in consulting or other potentially industries that don't have a large component of in-person working uh, workers, they had no intention of greatly changing anything in the next six months to a year. Um, and they talked about how they had made some considerable changes to support these changes in work modality for the future. So across the board for the companies that we spoke to, it looked like they were communicating, we believe that hybrid is here to stay. We're just trying to understand what employee groups are going to be experiencing that hybrid and what is hybrid to us. Great, makes a lot of sense. So another question that came in is, you know, in your research, did you notice any trends relating to the number of days in the office versus at home for the companies that are using these models? It seems like maybe the three, two model seems to be kind of emerging as the most prevalent, but I, you know, I'm curious what you saw in terms of dominant models, but also the variability across these models within organizations. One key element there that we saw was, um, you know, it wasn't company to company, but it was team to team and geography to geography. So some of the companies that we spoke with had a different answer for that based on the specific office. As an example, uh, one of the companies said that they had anchor days where they would come in two days a week um, and the team would agree on what the, those days were. And um, while that worked very well in their European offices, it did terribly in their US offices. And so when they were approaching the number of days in or out, it was around what the workers um, in that specific geographic region would be most inclined to follow. And then allowing the teams and the managers and the folks that are actually on the ground to figure that out, um, to figure out what would be most impactful for them. Great. So yeah, I mean, that idea of really tailoring it to your work group and what makes sense for the nature of the work, the nature of the people in your group makes a lot of sense as opposed to a one size fits all model. You know, the, right. Another question that came in is around, you know, we've seen a lot of talk or studies around, you know, how hybrid work can increase or at least maintain productivity. Um, in your work, did you come across any research or in your discussions with any companies find cases where they talked about maybe decreases in productivity that they saw as a result of moving to remote or hybrid work? Any kind of contrarian examples of where maybe things went, went off the rails? I think one of the spaces that we saw productivity going down was less at the sort of um, subject matter expert level or middle management level and more at the highest level of management. And um, one of the reasons we saw that was because um, of collaboration overload. So senior leaders who, you know, previously were, were going into the office and you could, you know, set up time on their calendars and get with them, they, they weren't experiencing the kind of volume and pressure um, of, of being, of, being required in conversations that they're facing now. And we actually saw that um, in some of the research that essentially it's not that their productivity is down, it's that they're being over, overwhelmed and not taking enough time to you know, allow themselves some breathing room to, to recharge. And so they're burning out over a period of time when they're just trying to help and, and, and support everyone else. So that's one place. Yeah, and just to add to that, I just wanted to reinforce, Brad, that in most of our conversations, the 
everyone always spoke about how if you actually look at the data, productivity was improving. There were very few cases where uh, the productivity was going down, but there's a lot of bias, like as Dan mentioned about the whole productivity paranoia that if people are working from home, the productivity is less. But actually we found so many use cases where they saw the business and the revenue actually increasing so much more. So that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, great. I mean, I think both of those perspectives are important. I think the, the point you make, Dan, about overload you know, among senior managers, I think we've seen that across a, a large segment of the workforce as well. You know, I think a lot of the research that came out has shown that a lot of these employees replace their commute time with just working longer hours, working more, and maybe that explains some of the productivity gains that we've achieved. But I think the big question is, how sustainable are those things long term, right? I mean, you know, we've seen higher levels of burnout, increased issues around well-being, uh, and so I think it raises questions about how do we balance those productivity and wellness issues uh, going forward. Another question is around kind of equity, and you kind of close your presentation with this issue, and there's been a lot of debate around you know, the remote and hybrid, and does it level the playing field or is it actually going to exacerbate, you know, biases and inequities that exist within organizations? You know, any thoughts you could share on, on that topic? Yeah, I think in our slide, it, we discussed how for specifically women and individuals with different disabilities, it makes it so that they're able to um, juggle the different needs that they have in their life whether, you know, women are usually doing a lot of additional homework, as we've seen in different research. And so hybrid work allows them to be able to deal with the other components of their life while they're also still working and kind of juggle that in addition to, you know, people who have disabilities and may struggle to get into the office. And that is just an additional level of barrier to them. Um, I think it's interesting because we've had a previous presentation where this conversation was brought up about, okay, this is increasing equity, but where is it going to now somehow lead to maybe uh, additional barriers to people developing in their career? If you're hybrid or remote, that makes it so you might not be able to be promoted at the same rate as someone who's in the office. I think that the conversation uh, should be translated into now that we have these technologies, now that we're able to kind of put a magnifying glass on how technology and new work modalities are supporting these groups. What does that mean in regards to updating our definitions of what productivity and a great leader and a great employee means? And continuing to work to understand how we can support these groups and maybe change the way we think about supporting these groups to better engage with them and push them forward in their careers. Great. I think, you know, the next question builds on that a, a bit in terms of the question states, you know, in the past, we saw employers largely mandating work hours and mobility policy. Recently, that's really shifted to where now we're giving employees a lot more kind of autonomy and control and influence than in the past. You know, what, in your opinion, does this suggest about um, the you know the availability of labor and labor market trends? And I guess you know I could add on to that saying. In your conversation with employers, I think there's a lot of debate. Well, will all this disappear if we go into recession and the labor market contracts and now employees need to keep those jobs and maybe don't have as much uh, as many options as they did in the past? What are your thoughts on some of these trends we're seeing in their lifespan? Yeah, we've definitely heard a lot about the balance of power, like with the pandemic, because of the opportunity and the importance of employee voice, especially in the newer generations, there's been a lot of focus on maximizing that employee experience and leaders have been finding ways in which they can do that. But with the recession and economy, the, we, like we've heard companies say that, that the balance scale is now like, it's more balanced now uh, with the power scale because uh, with the with the recession, employees do want more stability and they're understanding that 
if some business really requires that in-person element and they've seen those results with the data, then they require them to come in person or really adjust to that level. And come and employees do want more stability because we are so much about the layoffs right now as well. So definitely it is sort of more balanced right now, but we're interested to see what happens in the end. Yeah, and one of the things uh, we heard about was sort of on the manufacturing side where factories were reporting challenges in attracting hourly workers or they were losing workers to uh, firms that were providing um, compensation policies that they just couldn't match. And so what, what we've seen is sort of a shift, a paradigm shift towards uh, away from extrinsic motivation to try to retain, retain these folks and moving more in towards intrinsic motivation, specifically giving choice um, and autonomy to those, to those workers to help them feel like they're more a part of the workplace. And on the manufacturing side, we actually saw uh, that flex work um, options are becoming uh, interesting and, and may very well become um, a normal in, in, in the near future. And it doesn't look exactly like it does for knowledge workers, but things like um, flexible working hours, compressed work shifts, work weeks, split shifts, shift swapping, essentially allowing folks to have a little bit more control over what they're going to do, how they're going to work, how long they're going to work, um, and, and allowing them some inputs there. Um, we've seen that that's, that's adding, uh, that's driving uh, engagement and helping to mitigate the fact that maybe they can't uh, provide the same salary, but um, they can give them choice. Great. So maybe one more question. Um, this one might be a bit more of your uh, predictions, but the question is, you know, given the response to remote and hybrid work, uh, how do you predict companies might embrace the possibility of work within the metaverse? Uh, I'm sure Meta, given the recent fall of their stock, would love it if everybody embraced working in the metaverse. And you did talk a bit about companies adopting VR and other things for onboarding employees today. So do you see this maybe one day expanding to where we're all going to be working in this uh, metaverse? I just based on what we've heard from different companies, I think that this, I don't know about the metaverse, but obviously in the past two years, we've had incredible technology come into the environment and be utilized consistently across different industries that maybe were a little bit more adverse to change and, and wouldn't always just so immediately accept these new platforms and technologies to support their workforce. So I'm not entirely sure about the metaverse. Um, and I think that a component to work is also the connections that we can make in our everyday lives in our careers. But that being said, you know, this connects to the conversation about are these changes here to stay or is are we going to return back to a different normal? I think the impact of techno technology alone has been such a, a great uh, catalyst for future change that it is hard to say what the future will look like. But as our first presentation said, uh, the only thing we can we can know for certain is that it is this technology is going to continue to push work forward and continue to change things up. Yeah, I think to add on to that, you know, uh, we we were talking about that a little bit when we were thinking about this and doing some additional research. And you know, it's an interesting question. And um, I think one thing that we've sort of found through our study and independent research is that. While the metaverse seems interesting and seems like it could be an answer to a problem, uh, I think that it might be the answer to the wrong problem, um, which is to say, is the problem that looking at a screen and talking with you guys over Zoom is, is reducing my ability to accomplish my goals or to collaborate, or is it something else? And I think that while metaverse might be something or, or some similar VR technology, might allow us to collaborate in some way better at some point. Um, I think it sort of rushed too quickly to a solution when the problem may have been collaboration, overload, productivity, over paranoia, that sort of thing. Um, and, and so that's what a lot of our research was saying. And um, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, it goes back to the idea of really matching the technology and the tools to the work and the collaboration and the interpersonal relationships that you need to really get the work done and to be uh, successful. So Dan, Holly, Rashi, thank you so much for sharing your uh, research with us today. Just for everybody listening, they'll be preparing a report, which we'll likely be distributing in January at some point. So uh, please keep an eye out for that. And uh, you know, we welcome you to share it with uh, all of your colleagues who may be interested uh, as well. So thank you again. So for our last presentation today, we have my colleague, Chris Collins, who will be uh, sharing some of his recent work that's really focused on better understanding the employee experience. So just a, a quick background on Chris. He's a professor of human resource studies and also our director of graduate studies here in the ILR school. He earned his PhD in organizational behavior and human resources from the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. Chris is a leading expert in the areas of strategic human resource management, the role of HR practices and leadership in driving employee engagement, and the role of HR in driving firm innovation and knowledge creation. His research on these topics has been uh, published extensively in our field's top journals. Chris also engages regularly with the HR practice community through his executive education, teaching, and consulting. And he is also the former director of CARS and a current member of our CARS advisory board. He's also a member of the Academy of Management, Strategic Management Society, and the Society for Human Resource Management. So with that, Chris, I'll turn the floor over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. Um, so let me just start. So I'm going to talk about this topic of the employee experience. So maybe let me engage you all a little bit. So if you would, in the chat function, um, just type in some thoughts that you have in terms of when you think about the employee experience, the context of your organization, what are some of the themes, words, HR practices that come to mind when you think about the employee experience? I'm a pretty patient guy, so I can wait while you guys type. In the meantime, I will um, pull up my deck so I can share that with you guys. It says, I'm getting a message here that the chat is disabled. All right. All right. So skip that. <laughs> we'll just move on. But you so can throw, uh, if you want, you can throw them in the Q&A and I can. Uh, no, no, that's all right. Put them out. So what I was right. hoping to start hearing from some of you is a lot of different ideas of where your companies uh, or where you as employees, where as you as leaders, managers are thinking about the employee experience. And it's pretty broad. When we think about what might be part of this um, experience that employees have as employees in your organization. So you might think of things like the feedback that they get from their manager or supervisor, it might be the learning programs or training programs they participate in, the collaborative environment they work in, which we've heard from this last presentation. It might be things like the workstation that they work at or the work tools they have could be the childcare services you provide them, it could be coaching they get or leadership support, uh, the retirement program they're signed up for, um, health and wellness programs are engaged in. What we know is employees experience work in lots of different ways. And so when we think about the totality of what constitutes the employee, employee experience, it's pretty broad. And so when I, when I ask that question, and this is a topic Honestly, we started down this path of the employee experience about six, maybe six and a half years ago. We did a, a few working groups on the topic of design thinking and, and consumer-driven HR, where we really talked about how companies were switching to think about employees really as consumers of a workplace environment. And so they often come in to work thinking about what am I getting out of my job? What have I experienced today? What's been my experience with this company? And as the world continues to evolve, as, as people have greater and greater access to information, we know that employees more frequently than ever compare their experience at work, both to their own expectations, but also to 
their perceptions of what those experiences might be elsewhere. And so even before the uh, the pandemic, I think we have lots of data to su suggest that the great um, great resignation started happening multiple years before the pandemic, that the pandemic, at least the early months of the pandemic stopped the, the great resignation because people are afraid to leave their jobs if they still had one. And certainly as um, the economy picked up in the last year and a half or so, we saw that great resignation explode again. But the, the turnover rates that companies were experiencing prior to the pandemic were the highest they'd been in about 15 years. So we'd really seen a, a, a big increase in turnover and, and employees leaving their employer. And so when I think about this idea of the employee experience, where I really take it from is that early work on the customer experience and how we translate many of the tools from that, that work in marketing and, and work in design thinking to the HR function, right? This idea of understanding the systemic ways that we shape employees' emotional connections, their affiliations with their organization. And so when I define this idea of employee experience, I really think about it as the combination of policies, practices, tools, interactions, systems, actions that impact employees and really shape their emotional connection to us as employers. And so when I think about, well, what does that mean for us as a function? I think what it really does is force us to focus on and recognize that individuals have lots of choice when it comes to work and they've got a lot of expectations uh, around what they expect from that workplace. And Again, being a, an older Gen Xer, right? When I first entered the workplace, I don't think it was that different. I think I came in with expectations of what I thought a job would be or how I wanted a company to treat me. I think often we put up or tolerated with more because we didn't know what other options existed. But I certainly think in today's world where it's so much easier to see what's happening elsewhere, to see reviews, hear from friends, see social media outlets talking about the, the experiences people are having at other workplaces, it really has created an environment where, where employees are acting much more like customers. So they know they have choice, they've got clear expectations, and across generations, this is not just a newer generations phenomena, they're really questioning whether they're getting what they want out of their workplace. And so the idea that we, we want to focus on creating a place that meets their expectations, creates the experiences that, that make people really feel like they've got a great place to work, really certainly helps us with that attraction and attention when it comes to the scarce talent we're trying to attract to our companies. It certainly helps them as they constantly reflect on how is my job relative to what that job might look like elsewhere? But I think it also is going to play a role in this increasing space around employee activism. So you see the companies that are most often um, seeing employee activism at this point, whether that's Starbucks, REI, these are places that in their categories, right in their, in their industry, are often seen as leaders in terms of HR practices or what they do and, and how they treat employees. But I think the talent they've attracted has really high expectations of what they want work to be. So it might put even more pressure on great companies to really continuously think about how they created the right work environment, the right experiences, where people aren't just attracted and, and want to continue to work for you. But does it also help to, to tamp down some of those possible moves towards employee activism? Um, to me, I think it's also this approach is a philosophy that really helps us to think about the key touch points that really impact our employees. I think it's also for HR, it's a mindset shift. And, and I guess I've been around HR long enough, I'm not quite as grizzled as, uh, as Kevin Cox is. He's got a few years on me, but we're pretty close. And so I think I've seen the evolution of, of HR in the last decade, two decades, really move more and more towards that idea of cost and control and really think about one size fits all, efficiencies. And where I really think we need to get back to is a little bit more focused on the outcomes we're trying to drive rather than the costs we're trying to maintain and really think more about 
re-engaging and re-involvement of employees in some of our decisions that we make as a function. Um, clearly, the research we've done suggests that this employee experience is a key driver of engagement. It's not engagement. So when I think about all of the recent literature in the popular press I've read on the employee experience, I see most of the consultants treating the employee experience as employee engagement, but on um, crack or on some kind of performance enhancing drug. They, they treat it as the next level of, of doing something. I, I think that's a totally false premise. I think what the employee experience is, is all those things that we can do that drive employee engagement, that drive that affiliation to that organization that really build the emotional attachment to our organizations. And the last thing I'll, I'll say about this is really when I, when I think about this employee experience, if you go back to that last slide, what all those words I had up there, what it really tells us is that this notion of the employee experience is, is really complex. And so what I wanted to do is um, really distill when I was putting this presentation together, forced me to really think again about, you know, what is the employee experience and is there some framework that we might have to think about the different ways, the different levels at which we impact the employee experience. And, and this is a work in progress, so I'll, I'll state that up front. But to me, at least from my synthesis of all the conversations I've had with companies and focus groups in one-on-one um, -on -one interviews is the topmost level. When I think of the employee experience, I think what we can think of it as is really episodic touch points. It's things that we do as organizations that employees don't use all the time. So if I'm getting ready to have my first child, I might start to look at childcare benefits or uh, other healthcare benefits or extending healthcare to a broader family. As I get close to retirement, I might look at more uh, opportunities to engage in activities the company set up around retirement. Or as I start to think about my personal health around the holidays and losing weight, do I go and look on the employee health and wellness site and see what the company is doing in terms of weight loss or um, exercise programs, right? So it's things that happen not every day, not even every week, but probably at different stages in life. And so there's times when we impact employees and they really feel that emotional connection or feel a greater level of support or investment in our company because of those episodic things we do. The second way that I really think this employee experience happens is what, I, what I've been calling recently reflection touch points. So these to me are more career oriented and, and, and really to me happen in some bundle of time, whether that's eight months, 12 months, 16 months, 18 months, where people sit back and reflect on how their job is going. Am I getting out of the company what I wanted? Am I making progress in my job? Am I making progress in my career? Do I see myself growing? So there's times where I step back and reflect not on a specific activity, but really reflection on how things are moving in my career and my time in this organization. And then the third level that I see is really the day-to-day -day touch points. So these are the things that impact me. It's not every day, it's certainly weekly. So I, it might be again, you know, the, the desk that I sit at and there's this wobbly chair that I sit on. Um, I think about the first day I, I came to my office at ILR 20 some years ago and my old computer that was sitting on a, a board across two, two um, seahorses that were or, uh, con construction horses that were really there um, set up as my desk. I'm like, how do I work in a place like this? Right. So those are the things that impact you every day. The colleagues you work with, your boss the lack of pens in the in the desk drawer to do writing with or my old computer, right? It's the day-to-day -to -day touch points. And, and I've intentionally, if you see this visually, really think about these as increasing in impact in employees, right? The episodic touch points, because they don't happen with great frequency, probably have the least impact in terms of how people feel about their organization at any one point in time. 
the reflection touch points because they're bigger, potentially more meaningful in terms of how people are evaluating themselves, their lives, their careers, probably more importantly. And I think what may swamp both of them is just how they experience work on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I'm gonna dig into each of the, the three of these a little bit more. So again, when I, when I think about the episodic touch points, I think about it as, am I getting the organizational support that I need when I need it at different points in life? And it could be described as the, the personal well-being touch point. So when there's been some change in my life, some change in my family, some change in my um, age group, whatever it might be, these are times where I might reach out to the organization for help, for services, for support from them. To me, this is the area where we as a function are probably, particularly for all the companies I've talked to, you know, light years ahead in terms of having much of this buttoned down that we've often been working at these programs for long periods of time. When we think about retirement, when we think about family programs or health programs, we've got lots of smart people who've created really smart programs that really can help employees at different um, points in time. This is also the, the level of employee experience where I think we most closely control or impact the way employees experience this. When I think about where we fail at this level, most often we fail in, in a few ways. And one of those is employees being able to find the right program when they need it. So that something happens or they wanna stop smoking or they wanna eat healthier or they wanna think about their retirement more seriously. They often have trouble finding on our website um, because we've got so many things that we're doing. Our search um, capabilities on those websites are often pretty limited, that it's actually a frustrating experience often for those employees to go find what they need when they need it. And again, as we've kind of changed the HR function delivery to be more self-service, there's fewer HR generalists running around for them to have those conversations with. So I think often one of the points where these become frustrating rather than engaging is because they can't find the things that they need. I think the second thing that often is frustrating to them is often these programs are fairly rigid, right? They're designed to be kind of one size fits all or they're really designed to be efficient in delivery. Um, so that's really not always personalized, not always the right fit to what I'm doing. I think the other Failure point is often employees sometimes don't even remember that they got the value out of these programs. And so they, they actually become uh, almost a zero impact when people think about how much do I value work at this company because they forget about these things because they happen so episodically. So if I were to tell companies like, how do we really get better in this space to have more impact um, on employee engagement really create stronger affiliation and attachment to the company. The first area I'd really spend my time is really around predictive push communications. And as we know, a lot of the programs we have really are fit for people at different points in life, different points of the year. So can we use predictive data to send out tailored communications to employees, right? Much like Amazon can tell me when I need to order more toilet paper or more uh, more razors um, or more shaving cream, can't we be a little bit better at knowing the different stage of life our employees are in and sending them some push communications around particular programs that might be the, the best fit for them. I think we can also think a little bit about how to create some nuance in these programs, really thinking about using design thinking to identify different personas, having some greater flexibility in the, the programs we create in this space. So that, you know, we don't certainly wanna customize every single delivery to each individual, but we could do this to, to broader groups so they feel a little bit more tailored. I think we can also spend a little bit more time, whether that's internally or bringing in some external help, just to make this um, bundle of information easier to find, more searchable, easier to understand in plain language what the program's for, who it's for, how to use it, how to enroll, right? Just making the process of engaging in these activities easier. And then I think 
where we also have not done a great job as companies is really um, tooting our own horns a little bit and reminding employees how many people have benefited from these different activities that we've done and, and really reinforcing that these are valuable and that many, many employees have taken advantage of them, have a little branding and communications that help people understand the value of these activities. So again, a lot of this is around making it easier, making it easier to spot, but it's also reminding employees that we do these things and, and how much it's impacted the lives of people in the company. The second level, again, I talked about was this idea of reflection touch points. So, you know, to me, again, this is, am I getting what I want out of my job and out of my career at this organization? And, and again, to me, this probably varies by person. Um, I'm probably an outlier in that I don't think about this very often, but I think the average person probably doesn't reflect on am I getting out of my job what I want every day? This is probably monthly, periodically as you come up against quarterly or half year performance reviews. As you get those reviews, people step back and ask those questions of, am I really getting back from this company what I'm, what I'm putting into it? So, you know, they might be asking things around, is this work challenging? Am I doing what I love to do? Have I acquired new skills or capabilities this year? Am I making progress toward, toward my long-term personal career goals? Um, what did I actually do this year? <laughs> and was it meaningful work? Um, so, you know, I don't think those are questions we ask again with great regularity, but certainly multiple times a year and certainly different time points of the year, we're probably asking that. Again, I think there are many aspects, much like the top layer, uh, I think there's many aspects of HR systems and practices that we put in place as organizations that impact people's perceptions of how they feel about the company and these reflection touch points that they have. Um, but Im importantly, I think we also have to acknowledge that the, these reflection touch points are also impacted by groups outside of the function. So our line leaders, how we're doing as a business, people's perceptions, what the external marketplace looks like. And so one of the, the key things that I think in terms of failure points is when I think about why we often don't have great feelings from our employees in terms of their career opportunities, their personal development, is what I'd call the final mile program delivery that we may have created a great career ladders, we might have created great career opportunities, but often that fails at the last level when they're having that conversation with their HR business partner, or they're having that conversation with their line leader. So I think one of the places we certainly have to get better is really thinking through for all these reflection points, have, have we created the opportunities? Have we really created the infrastructure that makes that last mile of delivery feel better for employees? Um, I think part of that, the issue here is that often investments that we make can sometimes feel like um, more work um, disguised as an investment. So, hey, I'm putting you on this extra project. I'm giving you this extra opportunity for more work. Uh, I'm giving you a, a second assignment or a third assignment. Uh, I'm putting on you on this short-term project on top of the work you've already done. I think one of the things that we've learned a lot in the last three years is that some of the turnover that's happened is because people thought that the investments we were making in them actually was just adding more to their plate and they felt burned out. So I think we have to think about, you know, if we're going to create more opportunities for growth and learning, how do we do it in a way that makes it feel balanced and not just more work? I think it's also hard for employees to assess this in a rapidly changing world. So, you know, as the great um, resignation was happening, I think a lot of people started questioning whether they should also jump ship. And it, if they're being treated as well as they should be. And again, I think they're constantly hit with more and more information around what others are doing and getting. So I think it's, you know, one of the failure points is I think some of this is happening more quickly or more often than it used to. And so people are a little confused and in, uh, in their own personal reflections. Uh, and again, part of it is just that people's expectations differ wildly. And so to, to deal with some of those failure points, I think where we need to invest 
certainly for me, one of the greatest investments companies can make is more predictive analytics in terms of career development and whether that's better understanding of how our jobs are going to be changing given new markets we're moving into or changes in our industry, what new skills do they need to build, what new capabilities do they need to build if they're going to continue to grow with us, whether that's the AI or other HR programs or, or technologies helping to surf through the organization and find those people that have the potential to grow, help them understand what skills to build, how to build them, are those internal trainings, external training. So really using data and predictive analytics more to help people understand how to grow so that they can be successful. As the, the students mentioned in their research, I think a big takeaway for me is really training and building capabilities in managers to be coaches. So that they're having more of these conversations where they can have powerful, reflective conversations about career opportunities, in job growth opportunities, in job learning opportunities with their employees to help them think about improving not just current performance, but really making themselves ready for other opportunities inside the organization and really investing in that management training is super important. Uh, I think we also have to get much better integration across silos that the data that's still trapped in different departments, solutions that have to come from multiple HR functions or, or COEs working together, or those COEs working better with HR business partners to deliver solutions, really important. I think this is where we also have to depend more on employees, helping us to think about possible solutions to some of these issues, really helping having them help us understand what's most frustrating, but also having them generate some ideas for solutions. All right, the last of the the three, so the the day to day touch points, and so you know, just as a thought experiment, I, I typed a whole bunch of different search words into Google around um, the employee experience. How do people feel about their employer? Employee feelings about work, uh, images related to those, and for every one of the images I got that looked like this, right? Employees happy, celebrating, excited about something that they're working on. I tended to see two or three that looked like this, right? Which, which I think tells us a lot about how people are feeling about work right now, which is, I, I love that uh, each of the images says something completely different to me, right? There's disdain, there's frustration, there's anger, there's dismay, all, all included in all these photos. And so I think just that quick thought exercise around, you know, how do people picture work? tells us a lot about what that day-to-day -day experience of work can be. And so, you know, when I think about the day-to-day -to -day touch points, it's it's really a question of what's it like here to work every day? And, and think of this as the, the daily frustrations that add up, that really impact how employees are feeling about your company. And those frustrations can come from certainly their interactions with HR stuff. How hard is it to fill out forms? Um, how hard was it to sign up for these benefits? Um, what were the hoops I had to jump through to do my own self-assessment on the performance dialogues for this year? But certainly that day-to-day -day experience is equally or probably more likely impacted by the way their leaders behave, the way their leaders treat them and interact with them, how their colleagues are showing up at work and their, their ability to get work done with them or through them. Certainly, it's impacted by IT and other central functions that impact their, their tools and the way work happens. It certainly happens with life. So how much of that frustration you feel about the job was the, the commute in or sitting on Zoom all day, right? So there's lots of things that, that impact us. So failure points here to me is that the biggest failure point is there's no single owner of the day-to-day -day experience of employees. Again, as you look back on that last slide, some of it's in IT, some of it's in HR, some of it's in the line leader, some of it's in the fact that we don't have enough employees on, on staff at this moment in time. Um, some of it is how things are shifting so quickly in the marketplace right now. And what was expected of me two weeks ago is different than what's expected today. So how do we solve for this biggest and most important one to me, part of it's getting back to our roots as HR, right? More listening posts, 
more qualitative feel and assessment of the organization that might come from the old management by walk around, right? How much of our HR business partners are spending time talking with employees? Do they sense a different feel and how people are reacting to the workplace? They have a sense of what's happening. Do we have ways for employees to feed us this information more regularly? We could also do it through more systematic pulse surveys that are you know, short, detailed questions about specific aspects of work. It's probably going to take better integration across functions. So it's not just integrations across HR, but also across HR and finance and IT all together. And again, I think this is where employee involvement in solutions is probably going to lead to the greatest results in terms of impact. So if you thought all of that sounded really easy, um, what makes it really complicated to me is the overlay of this is it's also going to differ widely by the region that employees work in potentially by job type by level by generation so i think what adds to the complexity of the employee experience is it's not ubiquitous that there are big differences in in terms of how people experience work potentially in our u.s offices relative to our offices in Brazil or China or India or Europe certainly might differ between our senior executive suite and those people on the shop floor. It might differ by our, our different generations in the workplace or, or lots of other individual factors. So how, again, the biggest takeaways to me that I've heard from this really data, data and more data being critical here, right? So more qualitative sentiment analysis, more management by walk around, observations from HR leaders and, and business leaders, more pulse surveys. I think it's a, the prioritization, which jobs are we experiencing the, the biggest issues with in terms of uh, the employee experience or which aspects of the employee experience seem to be the, the biggest hotspots for us right now. I think getting more employee involvement in this, super important. Um, more partnerships and collaborations across HR functions, across functions outside of HR and with line leaders, and really integrating um, with other factors that also impact employee engagement, right? So think about the broader mission purpose of the organization, our broader brand, really think about how to pull all these together to impact employee engagement. All right, so I'll leave it there, open it up for Q&A. Um, Great, thanks, Chris. So I think, you know, given all we've been hearing about the employee experience, this framework is really helpful for us to think about the different kind of levels that you laid out and the different ways we can influence it. So a couple of questions that have come in. I'll start with one that I actually had early in your presentation. You kind of started with this idea of, you know, employees acting more like customers. They've always had expectations, but the difference now is that they have much more information about, you know, what else is out there, right? And they're always making these comparisons to what they have. And in my mind, that really linked to another topic that I know you've studied quite a bit, which is employer branding. And, you know, I think when we talk about branding, we often talk about, well, it's, you know, we should both kind of, you know, message to outside candidates, but also internally. But the reality is, I think we've often focused on the external much more than the internal. I know you made this point about reminding employees about what we're doing for them, but can you talk a little bit more about maybe where this intersects with that idea of employer branding, particularly with our internal employees? Yeah, so I, I actually think that's a, a super important point, Brad, is more time than not when we think about employer brand, it's some external marketing piece to take out on the roadshow for um, college recruiting, or it's up on our website. And um, we forget that our internal employees need that reminder, right? And so I do think more internal comms, and, and again, this could be scheduled at different points throughout the year. It could be targeted towards different populations, but a, a good reminders around what does make us special, and maybe we're not great at everything, but here are the real strengths of working at this company, and, and really tailored that to what we're hearing from our employees in terms of what's most important for them. So it's some combination of, you know, again, that groundwork to having spent time with employees to know what matters, and then reminding them what we do in those spaces. Great, so another question that came in and it goes to a point you kind of hit quite a bit at the end around this data, right? We really need data. 
the question is, you know, how does this link to employee engagement surveys? We're already doing those. Should we continue doing those? I think to your point around engagement and employee, employee experience being different, it seems like we should be using different measures for both, but I'm curious about your thinking on those and how they maybe connect. Yeah, so I'm not sure I'd measure um, the employee experience. And again, this is where I keep seeing new consulting reports and new consulting ad sales promos coming out around there, um, how they're going to measure and assess the employee experience. To me, the, the employee experience really is the driver of, or one of the key drivers of employee engagement. But I think that means we need to measure employee engagement better because in, in a lot of the past engagement surveys, I think what we used to see is some mix of things that might drive engagement with those measures of, of actual engagement. And so when I think of engagement, engagement to me is really that emotional connection to the organization. And that can happen because I love my job. It could be because I love this company. It could be because I love my manager um, in a healthy employee sense. And, and I really love working with my colleagues, right? So it's some combination of those four things. And so if we can get better measuring that. We can see where you know, employees are not feeling that same deep attachment, same positive commitment, um, connection to the organization. I think then we can dig in to figure out with the qualitative data, what part of the employee experience may be negatively impacting that. So, so what aspect of work is really creating the negative emotions? And so I think separating those two, super important in terms of data. I wouldn't mix the two for sure. Yeah, that's an important point because I think often we look at these engagement surveys, it's kind of completing those antecedents and engagement, right? So and, it's all kind outcomes. of, yeah, putting it all, putting it all in one bucket. Yeah. So, you know, I think you highlighted a numerous kind of failure points and where companies can make investments. So, if a, you know, someone listening today is trying to think about, right, you know, it's really great. Where do I start? You know, do I really kind of nail down those episodic touch points? Do I really focus on the day-to-day -day experience of employees? Do I kind of try to make improvements in all three areas, where, where would you advise that companies really take the first step here? Um, yes, <laughs> um, some combination. And, and uh, again, my consulting answer will always be, it depends. So to me, I think there's easy wins. And I, and I, I think the easiest win is really in that top category, the the episodic piece is is really doing some quick work there in our COEs that own those, really around better communications of what we have, easier searching. That That is not a high investment um, set of activities that might actually lead to pulling some of those programs, getting, getting rid of programs that don't have high usage. But I think advertising, marketing, branding that stuff better and reminding people that they exist and pushing information them better, I think that can happen pretty easily. I think the other part to me then is really looking at starting with the engagement data and seeing are there particular employee groups that are most at risk for leaving because of low engagement, low, low connection, low affiliation with the company, and then going in and doing some groundwork, some field work with them to say, you know, try and get a sense from them as to why that is and, and what aspects of the, their employee experience is causing it. So I, I would probably, with limited resources, I wouldn't try and do this for every group. I'd look at those jobs that are both super critical of the organization, but those jobs where we also see lower than desired engagement and really focus on them and then do some intensive conversations, whether that's virtual through technology or focus groups or even one-on-one -on -one interviews to get that qualitative data to, to really understand where their ex employee experience is off from, from what we want in terms of driving engagement and then focus on those as my first interventions. So a question just came in, uh, you know, how should companies train managers and leaders to deliver a compelling experience and drawing on an industry that I know from your prior career, you're, you're very familiar with hospitality and restaurant, you know, should we be taking those types of approaches as we think about employees as customers to really uh, think about how do we train managers to be creating a, a excellent experience for our employees? Are there models out there that we can leverage like that or maybe in other places? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. I, I mean, to me, the, you know, you and I have been working on the, these working groups on um, 
managers related to performance management and to employee engagement for years. And, and I think the biggest takeaway I've had in the last eight years is that every employee is different. And so really training employees or, or managers rather on how to have meaningful conversations with their employees and meet them where they are is where I'd spend the, the bulk of my time really helping managers create a better experience. And, you know, there's lots of things they can't fix, right? They might not have the resources to give you new computers every year or solve the desk situation if we move to some hybrid environment where people have to come in and find their own workstation every day, right? But having a conversation, at least acknowledge it, um, talk through the frustrations, think about, you know, individual workarounds, how, how collectively as a team we can do this better or figure things out. I think those are the kinds of behaviors that really across generations lead to a better experience. And, and that's, you know, as much as I'd love to say that's easy, I don't think most managers are have, comfortable having those conversations. They're afraid to promise things. They're afraid to hear about problems. They're afraid to give some tough love. And so I just find that making them more comfortable having human conversations, I think is going to be the biggest step. Um, helps them become better coaches, helps them help their employees solve their own problems. I think that's what's going to create the better work experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So I think we have time maybe for one more, Chris. I'm just curious on your thoughts of where, where and how should technology fit into this? It seems like there's parts of this, particularly at the episodic level, we can probably automate because we know employees are going to hit different life stages or January comes along where everybody's making those New Year's resolutions yeah. around health and wellness, and we can push certain things out. It seems like at the day-to-day -day level, it's much more high touch. It's much more that manager, non-automated kind of approach. You know, How do you see technology playing a part or automation across different levels of this? Yeah, I see automation having its biggest impact at the top two, certainly at the top one, where, where again, you know, if we get better predictive analytics on when people might need these programs or who might need them, I think we can do a lot more push with chatbots and and other AI-driven solutions. I think even in the middle around career discussions, having AI prompting managers to have these conversations with employees, having AI prompting employees to, to seek different training opportunities given their profile, to have AI or other uh, chatbots pushing information to them around career opportunities that are popping up that meet their profile or meet their career aspirations short-term projects, long-term projects, job opportunities. I think we can do a lot more with AI in those spaces, but I do think that day-to-day -day is probably more um, individual tailored stuff that's gonna come from human conversation. So I think the last one is both the biggest and hardest because it's a lot more personal in people, uh, how people are experiencing that job. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thanks again, Chris, for you know sharing all of this with us today. I know, as you said, it's a, uh... It's a work in progress, and you're, you'll be continuing to you know work on this into the spring and next year. So I'm sure we'll have more kind of cars programming around this, and certainly encouraging those that are interested in this to to be on the lookout for those sessions. Uh, so would like to take a moment to, to close. Thank all of our presenters today, Chris, our three Mylar research assistants, as well as uh, Kevin Cox. Excellent presentations. I think they've given us great insight into leading in this very uncertain environment from very different perspectives, which I think has been uh, wonderful. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you find today's session valuable. We'll be sharing out uh, recordings with you of this session. Certainly encourage you to share it with others uh, in your organizations that may be interested. Uh, we'll be soon posting our calendar of events for the first half of next year uh, for CARS. So please do visit our website regularly and keep an eye out for events that might be of interest to you uh, and your team in the new year. Until then, I wish you a wonderful holiday season and a happy new year. And thanks again for joining us. Take care.